Good evening, everyone. Uh, is everybody connect? Is everybody able to to hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right. Then we start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Pallares, and I represent the Center for the Study of the Environmental Law of Tarragona, also known as CEDAT. On behalf of CEDAT, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the sixth Tarragona International Environmental Law Colloquium, jointly organized with the Tarragona Environmental Law Students Association. This year, the colloquium title is Environmental Law and the Challenges of the Decades Ahead, Promoting Transformative and Recovery Responses to the Planetary Emergency. My duty in this official welcome is to present CEDAT. This center was created in 2009 and it focuses on specialized training activities in environmental law, research activities, service to administrations and companies, and support activities for citizen platforms and non-governmental uh, organizations that defend the environment. The approach of the CEDAD is based on the commitment for the environment and to adopt an environment justice perspective that takes into account the rights of present and future generations. Among our activities, I highlight, firstly, the master's degree in environmental law that began in 2006. This master is becoming a reference program with a high degree of internationalization of its students. Secondly, the Catalan Journal of Environmental Law, which published its first issue in 2010, and which is obtaining the highest classification at the state level and international recognition. Thirdly, the Environmental Legal Clinic, where students resolve real cases, allowing learning in a real environment and developing at the same time the social function of the university. And last but not least, the Tarragona International Environmental Law, Colloqu Law Colloquium organized by the Environmental Law Students Association and the CEDAT. This annual colloquium has an increasing impact. Today, today's colloquium is attended by more than 60 participants from at least 15 countries, as Spain, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Republic of Mauritius, the United Kingdom, Italy, Peru, Colombia, Portugal, China. I wish all of you three frightful days of, of interesting and beneficial debate and learning. And I also, I want to welcome you again. Now, is the turn to my colleague, Estefania Asensio. She is going to follow with the official welcome, explaining some key matters about the organization and the colloquios, the colloquios program. Thank you very mu much, Anna. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Estefania Asensio and I'm a part of the organizing committee. On behalf of the Tarragona Environmental Law Student Association, EDAD, we are deeply honored to welcome you to the sixth Tarragona International Environmental Law Colloquium, Environmental Law and the Challenge of the Decade Ahead, promoting transformative and recovery responses to the planetary emergency. First of all, we would like to thank the Rubira Virgili University 
Students Council, AGAU, SEDAD, and the rest of entities which have contributed to the success of this colloquium. We are also honored to have Angelica de Fritas e Silva from University of Westminster, Farhana Sultana from Syracuse University, and Tanya Wyatt from Northumbria University for their participation as keynote speakers. They are understanding researchers and practitioners. We also like to thank the scientific committee, Lina Munoz Avila, Jordi Jaria Manzano, and Lionel Ryan for reviewing the received abstract. We would like to especially thank the attendees for taking part of this event. We highly encourage you to engage in the colloquium and take an active role in the discussion of each panel. As you know, the colloquium aims to provide a forum for a scholar with different backgrounds to present and discuss their research and work in progress. These events also, look, also seeks to create a friendly environment for meeting and interacting with fellow students and colleagues that share a common interest for environmental law and human rights and ecosystem protection. Particularly this year, we are convinced, convinced that environmental law cannot be understood without the support and feedback from environmental science, geography, sociology, or philosophy. So we think a comprehensive and interdisciplinary perspective is essential for enrich enriching the debate and promoting transformative response. Therefore, we are more than happy to welcome the panelists. This year colloquium will include a number of advanced topics regarding human rights, climate change and COVID, forestry law, climate migration, sustainable food system, circular economy, strategic litigation, green criminology, health security, international narratives, ethic of association, and so on. It is really nice to have guests from so many different nationalities and backgrounds. We are also glad for meeting familiar faces in this sixth edition and also welcome new colleagues to the, to, to the tech community. Last but not least, I would also like to acknowledge the work done by the organizing committee, especially to Beatriz Felipe, Clara Esteve, Paulina Junca, Lorena Martinez, Hilaria Gallus, Monica Pons, Laura Presiche, Malca San Lucas, Amadeo Espiga, and Anthony Pigrao. Every day, every year, organizing the colloquium is a challenge, but last two years, as you all know, we have had to cope with an extra challenge, COVID-19, the mobility restriction and the virtualization of events. We would love to we would love to have you all in Tarragona for a present conference, but we were not sure if the situation will be optimal. Therefore, we decided to carry out this sixth edition as virtual, um, on virtual mode. We thought it was worth it to persist in our academic, academic objectives in this increasingly complex world. As last year, this means, sadly, we will not have our famous dinner and social activities, but we have to try to make it as interactive as possible. We hope we all have a great experience during these three evenings. And, and now, finally, I will give some uh, technical and practical issues about logistical and structure. And today and the next two days, we will have three keynote speakers, 12 oral presentations organized in three, four main panels. Please uh, visit our WhatsApp to see more details about the program. Regarding the structure in, in each panel, uh, the keynote speaker have 25 minutes and the presenters have 12 minutes each. We will use the rest of the session for discussion, question and answer for all keynote and speakers. Please keep the microphones and camera off while you are not speaking. The, we remember that the ancient audience can make questions through the questions and answer future, and one member of the organizing committee will collect them. You also use the chat to share any relevant information. The session will be recorded and broadcast live through Facebook. Uh, we still have some few tickets uh, for the next panel, so you are more than welcome to register and share this event. 
And we really hope this colloquium provides us uh, not only essential knowledge, knowledge, but also a great opportunity to share experience on challenge of the decade ahead and how we can promote a transformative answer to the planetary emergency from different perspectives and background. Now I'd like to give the floor to Beatriz Felipe, who will be in charge of moderating this first panel of the sixth deck. Thank, thank you everyone and welcome. Many thanks, Stephanie, for your very nice and lovely presentation. Also many thanks uh, to Anna, for introducing this sixth edition of the Tarragona International Environmental Law Colloquium. It's a pleasure for me and I'm honored to be part of this organizing committee and I'm more than happy to be part of this first panel and act as a chair for a, such a fantastic compendium of authors. So let's go very fast to do a very nice introduction of our first keynote speaker. As you know, our first keynote speaker is Dr. Angelica de Freitas e Silva. She, Angelica, her research interests include energy-related decolonial approaches, epistemologies and methodologies, environmental justice, global and social justice, social movements and resource conflicts in the global south. She has a background as a construction lawyer in Brazil, Angelica finished her PhD from the University of Westminster Law School in 2019, and she's one of the coordinators of the Law Development and Conflict Research Group with the Westminster Law School. Since 2016, she holds a post of senior lecturer at the University of Westminster Business School of Applied Management, where she teaches the disciplines of contracts, tort, and property law. As a lecturer, Angelica is also engaged with the critical pedagogical, pedagogical sorry for that, discussions around decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing academia, leading extension project on this matter. Angelica, many thanks for being part of the Tarragona International Environmental Law Colloquium. She will give um, a presentation entitled Environmental Law in the Ethics of Exhaustion. <laughs> Exhaustion, sorry for my pronunciation today. We are really honored to have you and the floor is yours. Many thanks. Oh my God, Beatrice. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Uh, so much to everyone, to the TIEC Colloquium organizers, uh, and I feel so honored uh, to be invited, especially to speak as the first uh, speaker. I, I, I can... I can feel goosebumps right now. So I'll start uh, my watch because I can lose myself speaking. And I'll just I just would like to confirm with you if you can still see me. Uh, can you see me? Because I changed my screen and I will not be seeing the Zoom screen. Yes, we can see you perfectly. That's great. <laughs> so um, uh, today I am I'm presenting, as said before, this. Um, text, this keynote on environmental law in the ethics of exhaustion. So let's talk about this. Good afternoon uh, to all. Buenas tardes, boa tarde. Here in London, it's like 29 degrees. So today's um, a celebration day, uh, but probably they're very unlucky in England with the weather thing that the good days are generally Mondays. So uh, so it is an honor to be here speaking at the sixth uh, TIEC that in 2021, the year of the first anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic, brings this urgent discussion, environmental law and the challenges of the dec decades ahead. I would like to start by reading a poem by Alessandra Munduk-Ruku, who is an indigenous leadership in the area of the river Tapajós. I'm going to read the, the poem in Portuguese and I will follow with the version in English. Uh, I think it's important to use the words that she used and not to get lost in translation. I quote, Os rios são nosso sangue, a água é sagrada, é nossa mãe, queremos nossa floresta de pé, nossos rios limpos. 
estão matando a natureza, querem exterminar nós, filhos da terra e das águas. Mas nós, Munduruku, não vamos deixar. Vamos fazer alianças com ribeirinhos, quilombolas e pescadores. Vamos lutar juntos com outros países e povos. As hidrelétricas, ferrovias, mineradoras, a soja não vai passar. Nosso sangue vamos derramar, se for preciso, para o Tapajós e todos os rios salvar. So, I will follow with the translation. The rivers are our blood, water, sacred, is our mother. We want our forest standing, our rivers clean. They're killing nature. They want to exterminate us, children of land and waters. But we, Munduruku, we won't let it. Let's make alliances with riverine dwellers, quilombolas, fishermen. Let's fight together with our countries and peoples. Hydroelectric, railways, mining companies. The soybean will not pass. Our blood we will spill if necessary for the Tapajós and all the rivers safe. With this poem, Alessandra Munduruku denounced at the World Alternative Water Forum, uh, FAMA in Portuguese, the acronym, in 2018, what the Brazilian, this government and companies are doing in the territory of their people in the state of Pará. She called for a global union and struggle for life against the big capital and its projects of death. Very well, let's start. Our struggle is for life, not for the right to live. Reflecting about the challenges of the decades ahead is about planning. This word that has been captured by the colonial disciplines of business management. They think of planning as means to guarantee a future within the constraints of the linear historiography of modernity and its institutions, grounded in the colonial intention of domination. Colonialism imposed the erasure, the annihilation of history and condemned the present, forcing peoples into the belief of a fetishized future that would arise from sacrifice. The nation state and the rule of law became one single beast, having everything beneath them. The institutional activity of planning embeds colonial violence. Modern sciences and philosophy embed colonial violence, violence announcing knowledges usurped from the colonies as their own knowledge. For the traditional disciplines of management, the rule of law is an ally. The challenges of using the role of law to protect the most vulnerable demands a deeper knowledge about how the tools that we used to fight, uh, such as legal mechanism, substantive law and procedure, were historically formed and attributed of meaning. In doing so, the painful realization that this framework of right is rooted in, in colonialities and will therefore demand violence to be viable. Coloniality is the ideology of power that, via historical hierarchization of territories, persons, and knowledges, imposes through time a mimicry of the colonial system's violence as means to access power. The ideology, uh, this ideology takes place via capitalist, racist, patriarchal, and militarized violence, setting up economic and political systems, social relations, and determines the human relationships with the ecosystems. In this global system of power imposed by the European colonial enterprises at the end of the 15th century, a specific modus of hierarchization of peoples, places and knowledges is perpetuated, naturalizing oppressive realities as the only way to exist in this world. There are three aspects of coloniality that are inseparable and interconnected, one leading to the other. The first one is coloniality of power itself, naturalizing historical and geopolitical dependence on the exploitation of natural resources for export. 
The second aspect is coloniality of being, in which peoples are hierarchized according to the gender, race, and class, and exposed to vulnerabilities created by the exploitation of natural environments, by ethnic cleansing, and by the non-inclusion of the population's demands and culture in the activity of planning, and also by siphoning the profits from environmental exploitation to the wealthy business owners and of course, international investors. The third aspect of coloniality is coloniality of knowledge. It's a realm that involves us all here today in which the definition of the environment and environmental futures are narrowed to Eurocentric epistemologies that legitimate the imposition of agendas that ensure positions of economic and political power. Epistemology is a big word, isn't it? It is a branch of philosophy concerned with the foundations of knowledge, the way knowledge is historically and geopolitically established, defines its application in the material, practical or praxis world. Thus, sorry guys, thus the way that the environment is known in the realm of ideas or a given approach to the concept of environment, the idea of, of the environment, will define the methodology of the epistemological approach to the sub, sorry, got lost a little bit in here. So <laughs> the activity of environment, um, the way that the environment is known in the realm of ideas or a given approach to the concept of environment will define the methodology of its use in the material world. So the activity of environmental planning is hence a consequence of the epistemological approach to the subject. The activity of environmental planning involves the methodology for obtaining and distributing natural resources, as well as the specific procedures or techniques used to identify, select, process, and analyze uh, information about what the environment's useful for, the information used in environmental planning. The, to illustrate this need for epistemological challenges, let us didactically borrow a metaphor from the legal doctrine of the fruits of the poisonous tree, which says that the original seed, if the original seed contains a poison, contains a vice, there will be a poison in the final product produced by that tree, that is the fruit. Hence, the concept of the environment's corrupted, planning for it, will yield a vicious product. The, if the environment is conceived of as imposed by colonial epistemologies as the endless source of power for the industrial financial capitalism, planning for it will be a set of practices to underpin, reinforce and enhance industrial financial capitalism with the violence entrenched to it. On the other hand, if the environment is conceived and perceived from a decolonial perspective as a need of all the peoples respecting the limitations of persons, living beings and the planet, its planning will be a set of practices for the benefit of all the persons, living beings and the planet. Although, of course, this is a very simple argument to epistemologically challenge the understanding of the environment, or in other words, to decolonize the comprehension of it, is a very complex task, uh, demanding a scrutiny of its philosophical, historical, political, territorial, ecological, and economic meanings. To discuss other epistemologies for environmental planning, we start by analyzing the meaning of the environment in the present to understand the relationship between epi the epistemology of the environment and the production and reproduction of life. This reasoning leads to a primordial issue of discussing the meaning of the environment, its ethics, the production and reproduction of life is the content of ethics, the material aspect of ethics. The content of ethics gains intersubjective validation uh, through formal social outcomes like norms and institutions. So this intersubjective validation must aim to fulfill 
the content of ethics, that is, must make the production and reproduction of life feasible. So this way, uh, the discussion about the epistemology of the environment sounds a big thing to, for a Monday afternoon, isn't it? Uh, the way that the environment is historically and geopolitically defined in the present is useful to check whether it supports the production and reproduction of life or not. Accordingly, understanding the ethics of the environment is essential to the discussion of environmental planning. The ethical system that we live in is the first global ethical system humanity has experienced. So uh, Enrique Dussel uh, is one of the uh, authors uh, that discusses ethical systems. Um, and this ethical system that we live became global through the success of colonialism. The modern colonial world systems ethics, that is, its universal claim for the production and reproduction of life accepts the hierarchization of bodies, territories, and knowledges as part of its feasibility, since surviving in coloniality demands the mimicry of colonial power as means to access power, and it is power in itself. In this way, we look critically at the ethics of the modern colonial world system from the perspective of those who have their bodily reality negated by the empirically impossible universal goodness claim of the dominant modern ethical system. The negation of the existence or the creation of victims due to the fetishized hegemonic ethical system makes it contradictory, reinforcing violence where it claims goodness. So let's talk about this. We argue that the hegemonic ethical system, the ethics of exhaustion, aims at death instead, the critical negative, negative aspect by not taking the structures that would enable life into consideration when defining the concept of human life. The hegemonic ethical system presupposes that everything in the planet exists for the service of human life, not as a cycle of interactions between human nature and natural phenomena. Magnifying the importance of human life happens to the detriment of all the forms of life and as a consequence causes human death. It's a one-way street in which everything exists in the service of human life. The life-bearing uh, beings such as plants and animals as well as the non-living things such as the land, the minerals, the air, the water, the sun and the natural phenomena. Human life is especially hierarchized since it does not include peripheric peoples, traditional communities, indigenous women, and peoples of color. Moreover, it locates the wealthy white men at the top of the hierarchy and the poor colored women uh, at the bottom. From a, a decolonial perspective, the earth is an interconnected system and the life of the mountain is as relevant as the life of the newborn and the snail, in the sense that one cannot exist without the other in a balanced cyclic way. By focusing exclusively on the life of the fetishized ethical subject, the hegemonic ethical system forces the exhaustion of everything else so that one type of individual can rep reproduce his own life. In a physical, psychological, and spiritual way, it exhausts the laborer who sacrifices her life to produce the commodity and gives her vital energy for the maintenance of the capitalist system. It exhausts nature by removing the, mi the mineral from the land without considering the natural resilience time for its reorganization and recreation. Or by changing the course of a river without considering the plants and animals that live from that water source, condemning all forms of life to evolve, adopt, and survive under the new conditions. In truth, uh, this is exhausting their vital energy to the limit that they have to compete among themselves to exist on what's left. 
It exhausts the energy cycles by human alienation, not permitting the reconciliation between the human mind and the territory, leading to the predatorial relationship that places human beings as the villains responsible for limiting the very conditions that reproduce their own lives. The hegemonic ethical system consistently is consistently aiming at exhausting humans' physical, psychological, and spiritual energy. All forms of non-human life, including natural resources and the energetic interconnection between the existing things, the natural phenomena, thus creating disequilibrium with catastrophic results, as we are very aware of. Then I ask... How can we plan the future, trusting a legal system that naturalizes violence? Audrey Lord would say that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I personally believe that there is that this system cannot be reformed. It is the poisonous tree. Decolonizing epistemologies means a complete shift on the priorities of our legal systems of our knowledge systems. It is something as bigger or even bigger than the European Enlightenment. It is time, it is urgent to perceive the interconnected oppressions and hierarchies that structure our legal institutions and the rule of law itself. It is clear that the priority when negotiating state level uh, commitments to break climate emergency is to enable ways for transnational monopoly financial system and its industrial complexes to remain existing. There is no bigger contradiction than this. For example, the idea that mineral resources are endless is just hurtful. The issue geochemical perspectives published in 2017 is, at to say the least, irresponsible. Written from the standpoint of exhaustive ethics, the work seems to be sponsored uh, a sponsored report to guarantee that investments in mining in the short future will be worthwhile. The authors argue that current, I quote, Current reserves of copper and aluminum are larger than in 1972, despite four decades of continually increasing yearly production. They argue on the reasoning of reducing the carbon footprint by digging deeper and more responsibly to increase efficiency and applying more up-to-date technologies. I quote again, Recent technological advance advances allow low-grade mass mining to depths of two to three kilometers to recover many of these deeper deposits, which will reduce the surface footprint and impact of mining. It's all about the surface footprint, isn't it? So the work asks a rhetorical question for, I believe, the purposes of their targeted uh, audience publication. Is it then, they ask, is it then reasonable to warn of imminent peak produ production of important mineral commodities? It's like 2017. We believe that the answer to their uh, self-reference question is obvious. Well, it's all good. We can keep mining, drilling, uh, as much as we want to profit from it. So foreign, the foreign direct investment risk would be stable, the price of commodities would not suffer the environmentalist threat, and the shareholders of the oil company would sleep well. In the modern colonial world systems, ethics of exhaustion, the idea that humans must radically change their relationship with the environment means going backwards in all the technological advance against development and improvements on quality of life indicators. Mining and the consumption of mineral resources is not a thing that came up after 1492 when the Spaniards, um, I don't know, went down to the Atlantic uh, or when the invaders made their wealth out of silver mines in Bolivia and the gold mines in Brazil. The problem is the pace of exploitation in light of industrial financial capitalism and the modus operandi regardless of the impact on communities and ecosystems. Another example, and I'm finishing, I promise. <clears throat> the disasters of Mariana, 
on in November 2015 and Brumadinho in January uh, in 2019. These disasters consisted in the collapse of two tailing dams, dams that are used to hold the toxic waste from the activity of mining iron ore using water. Uh, of uh, these two tailing dams that collapsed belong to the mining company Vali or within their shareholders structure and their uh, subsidiary structure. These are considered the worst environmental catastrophes in Brazilian history to this date. Thousands of people, animals and plants were murdered. Communities, especially traditional communities such as Quilombolas and indigenous and riverine traditional peoples, vanished. Agricultural lands were devastated, rivers irreversibly destroyed. Uh, and of course, toxic mineral waste spread through thousands of kilometers uh, of rivers up to the Atlantic Sea. The intentionality of the outcomes of these disasters is framed in the ethics of exhaustion's intentionality in creating victims. Follow me. Tailing dams are part of the mining business. They create irreversible interventions in the environment. The mining business aims at producing commodities for surplus value. The means to produce commodities, labor exploitation and environmental destruction are necessary for the business success. In the ethics of exhaustion, such downsides are necessary, therefore naturalized and hence invisible. The victims are not perceived before the catastrophe, but they are fundamental, co-constitutive for the implementation of the mining business. Therefore, the profit from mining only exists because of the victim, victim sacrifice. The naturalization of mining as a saving sacrifice transforms the predatorial character of the activity into the only possible way to obtain mineral inputs. Large scale, labor intensive, environmentally harmful for commodity export. This naturalization is, epistemic, is epistemically violent. Violent epistemologies are direct coercive ways of imposing meanings to legitimize agendas that ensure positions of power. When the tailing dam collapse, the number of victims is bigger, but the victims, persons and the environment were already part of the business. The collapse looks different. It looks like it's not intentional, looks like an accident. Uh, exclusively because it does not bring profit to the owner. Dams collapsing is not part of the business, therefore not naturalized in the saving sacrifice, uh, epistemically violent discourse. The violence entrenched in the imposition of large scale mining is epistemically naturalized, softened until it becomes non-perceptible. The predictability uh, sorry, the predictably wanted, unwanted consequences of large-scale mining are intentionally detached from the predictably wanted consequences. It's like committing a crime in which the agent not only produces the initially intended result, but also goes beyond and produces the worst result. Uh, the business owner intended to create victims, but did not intend to lose capital. When the victims are created without generating profit, the results are accidental. The accident is about money, it's not about the victims. The victims are fundamental to the business success. Soon, they will transform tragedy into profits too. Oh, I love the smell of a pandemic in the morning, said the capitalist wolf in this apocalypse now. Mariana e Brumadinho are examples of the modern colonial world systems ethics. What is impossible to fix with severe legislation, transparency, and compliance. There is no catchword in economics that will bring the river back to life. There is no carbon footprint remedy that can restore the lives and livelihoods of the affected communities. There is no social impact study that can assess a better performance and efficiency of the existing remaining iron ore waste dams in the region because it doesn't matter. Every year, there are numerous environmental crimes like this around the third world, especially, caused by criminal actions of transnational corporations. 
due to the legal characteristics of such businesses, the ones that benefit from the prejudicial enterprise are not held liable when predictably unwanted consequences of their actions or omissions cause incalculable harm. Protected by the corporate veil, and I, I, I promise I'm finishing, uh, protected by the corporate veil, the masters benefit from the law that encourage their types of businesses in the domestic environment. In the name of progress, of course. They say it is a saving sacrifice. It's not. It's just death. This means, my concluding remarks, uh, that our institutional definitions and further approaches th to the environment must aim at the production and reproduction of life. It is an urgent academic task to perceive epistemic decolonization to transform the present in order to stop condemning the future to social and environmental catastrophes. Our struggle is for life, not for the right to live. Nossa luta é pela vida. Não pelo direito de viver. Nuestra lucha es por la vida, no para el de derecho a vivir. Finally, quoting my good friend João Carvalho, paz entre nós, guerra aos senhores. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Angelica. That was a fantastic presentation, really inspiring. And uh, we were talking on the chat and we were saying that we love your, pas your passion and maybe we think that you are like um, academic activist and we love to have you in the TIEG because it's just fantastic to don't keep only ourselves reading some theories and so on, but uh, it's really nice to hear a keynote speaker with such a passion. We are in love with your presentation. We have to say that. Oh my God, thank you so much. I'm sweating of nervousness <laughs> in here. It's like, um, it has a very strong, when I, 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 I've met that poem for the first time, I, I cried uh, so intensively because it, you can feel that woman. Totally. Yes. So thank you so much for the opportunity again. Um, <laughs> thank you. It was fantastic. And also, I just want to say that the, in the first edition of the DX, we were discussing about rethinking sustainable development in terms of justice. And it, it was so related to your expl explanation today that it was just uh, fantastic. So thank you so much. I'm sure we will have a lot of questions, but if it's okay, we will keep them at the end of the panel. So it will be a richer discussion with the rest of the panelists. So it will be lovely if you can wait with us and discuss later on for the questions that we will have for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Beatriz. Thank you, Angelica. That was very, very nice, I tell you, honestly. So before we move to the first panel, on the, I forgot to say before that um, we will have four panelists in each one of the panels. Each panelist has 12 minutes. Please keep attached to these uh, 12 minutes that you have. You can, of course, use one or two minutes extra, but uh, not 20. That would be fantastic. Also, I wanted to say that the audience, please keep your questions, or you can also use the question and answer tool that you have in the bottom of your screen, and you can ask your questions there, or you can just ask them at the end of, of the session. Both options are great, so just feel free to do wherever you feel more comfortable with. So, to begin with the first panel after this fantastic presentation that uh, we really enjoyed it. So we will move to the first panelist. We will have a Ropa, Ropa Nant Mahadiu. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it well. I, I hope I've done my best. He's uh, from University of Mauritius and his uh, presentation is entitled Reengineering Environmental Law on the Basis of the Human Rights to Environment. So, Ropahana, you the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Madam. And uh, it's it's an immense pleasure to be to be with you. In fact, it's my first interaction with uh, um, a Spanish university and, and a Spanish uh, institution. 
even if uh, I must admit that uh, my favorite football team is Spain and I'm waiting for their first opening match for the Euro, which is tonight against Sweden. <laughs> Uh, it's also good to interact with uh, uh, Spanish universities and uh, especially with this colloquium. So <clears throat> as you rightly mentioned, my intervention is uh, uh, on an idea which is still uh, at a, a rough stage, but at the same time, I would not claim as if this is an idea that comes uh, uniquely from me, but this is an idea that is already there in legal literature. So in that sense, other legal researchers have been considering this idea. But the thing that I'm trying to bring in is an African perspective. As you mentioned, I'm from Mauritius. Um, Mauritius is uh, an African country. So we are part of the uh, African Union and the larger uh, African human rights and political structure. So my basic feeling is that uh, uh, there are a few things that we can learn from the African system, especially with regards to the environment. Um, I think uh, the first keynote speaker has made my work quite easy uh, with her passionate speech, because uh, I think uh, um, I, I, I no more have the responsibility to, to present on how serious environmental violation is becoming and how uh, we require urgent action for that. So I think uh, this is a basic assumption with which uh, we, we can start. And just to add that uh, the situation is not uh, bleak and very negative only in uh, uh, Latin American countries, because uh, this is uh, the region of the world from where uh, she took uh, 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 very good examples. But then the same story goes also for a lot of African countries. So basically what uh, I have been trying to research on is how um, the existing human rights structure, I'll explain later what I mean by structure. So how the existing human rights structure can help in the prevention and in the general protection of the environment. Of course, if I am trying to link environmental protection with human rights, then uh, the basis with which, uh, as I said, not only me, but other researchers around the world are trying to go is uh, to, to have the recognition as well as the implementation of what we call a human right to environment. Well, let me start first by saying, why do we need a human right to environment? Because some people might say uh, we already have an international legal regime, which we call the international environmental law, and, and, and which, uh, uh, if we develop further, can be a good uh, area of law that can help in the promotion and the protection of uh, the environment. That is true. Um, I am in no way, or general literature, no way tries to confront these two different regimes of law. So international environmental law is doing its perfect job on one hand, but then international human rights law can help in that protection. But then when we look at international environmental law, of course, the basis would be various treaties. And I hear I can start with the real declaration. And from there, we move on and we keep going up to the 2015 Paris agreements. In between, we have had so many very important treaties and protocol, such as the Kyoto Protocol. But then the general sense may be that these treaties and convention, or in general, the, the international environmental law regime can be one which is, which, is, which is quite political. Well, this is not a criticism, but uh, this is how it is. I mean, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, for instance, uh, you know, the essence of it is having uh, countries coming together. And when we say country, they are the powerful countries, the, as we say, the developed countries together with the least developed countries. So all of them coming together and trying to agree by way of consensus on what should be a, a limit, for instance, without getting into too much of scientific debate, but what should be a limit in terms of uh, carbon emission. So we agree politically on a limit, but then we have seen that, uh, you know, for instance, sometimes we may even happen that the most important country being the US as the biggest polluter may have a president in the Trump style who will not agree with any of these and will who will who will remove um, the United States from the Paris Agreement. So in that sense, uh, the, the basic idea is that this regime, despite being extremely important, but they can also be quite political and uh, in a way too much of political consensus may be required from that regime. And this dilutes a bit the effectiveness 
of this regime when it comes to protection of the environment. So then what we try to do is that we try to see how international human rights law can help in this, right? Let me just give an, an example. So in, in 1945, when the United Nations was created on, on, uh, on the basis of the UN Charter, the UN Charter already had provisions that uh, emphasize the importance of fundamental freedoms and human rights. But this did not prevent the international community to create, um, of course, under the aegis of the UN itself, but then to create a specialized system that we will eventually call the international human rights system. Uh, it started with the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then 1966 with the two covenants, the ICCPR and the ICSCR. And then from there, we have had uh, uh, many very important human rights treaties. So you see, sometimes a political system is important, but then in parallel, side by side, it is very important to develop a specialized system with regards to that. So by analogy to this, we have the international environmental law regime in terms of uh, a system which, of course, is given feedback from the scientific world in terms of what exactly we should do, in terms of what should be the limit, in terms of, you know, the, 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 uh, the rise <clears throat> in terms of temperature. So that is the spine, so to speak, of, of the protection. But here, we just want to say that if we manage to create the international human right to environment, then perhaps this basis can be very supportive of this regime. Now I come to the ways in which the international system uh, of, uh, in which the international human rights to environment can be uh, very supportive. Um, of course, but, but before that, very quickly, we know that the human right to environment has been recognized domestically in a lot of countries. And especially here, I think Latin American countries through their constitution, they are champions in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the human right to environment. I think they have gone a few steps further by you know, even considering the earth, for instance. So for instance, Bolivia has an earth charter. So for them, the earth, you know, just like in, in, in company law, we have the company as a, a, a separate legal personality. So the company is considered as a moral person, just like a, a human being will be considered as a physical person. So. In, in some Latin American uh, states, we know that the environment has been given a legal personality, which is perfect, which, which is uh, a huge progress and, and advancement. And um, in, in the same way, many constitutions, African constitution, non-African constitution, they have recognized the right to environment. But where progress is lacking is at the international level. Um, when we look at the, 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 the very many treaties and conventions or protocols developed with regards to the environment, we fail to see whether the environment has been regarded as a human right. So I doubt that any international legally binding instrument will say at the UN level will say that there is a human right to environment, right? So this is what uh, you know, we, we, we're trying to work on in terms of, of changing that, right? But now, now how, how to change that? Of course, uh, it may go through, for instance, a system of adoption of a convention, or at least to begin with a system in terms of adoption of a declaration, just like we have a UN declaration on the right to development, then perhaps we could have a UN declaration on the right to environment as a basic human rights. Now, advantages. Um, what is good with the environment, uh, sorry, what is good with the human rights system is that, uh, you know, a list of human rights have, have been recognized uh, in, in the form of treaties and conventions. And then it's like a dialogue between the duty bearer, which normally is the state, and the right holder, which are the citizens, right? So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vertical relationship between the duty bearer and the right holder. So in this sense, I give an example. When we talk about the right to environment, so the citizen as the right holder knows what it means to have the right to environment. And on the other hand, the state as the duty bearer knows what are its different obligations with regards to the environment. It becomes quite an easy uh, equation in terms of if one of those obligations are violated, then we have institutions such as quasi-judicial bodies, 
an example would be the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, but we also have judicial bodies such as the International Court of Justice. So in the same way, if we manage to recognize and implement a human rights to environment, then it will be as if we are using human rights to protect the environment, right? Protecting the environment because the envir environment then would be considered as, as a right. So protecting the environment would automatically become a right to uh, a human right, which will be called the human rights to environment. And as I said, the advantages is this vertical relationship. So when you know exactly, for instance, uh, a citizen has a right to environment, and on the other hand, a right necessarily means an obligation, a duty to protect, promote, fulfill, um, then it means that uh, governments or, or the states in general would be uh, more legally bound to respect those uh, environments. Secondly, the uh, international human rights architecture also provides for further development in terms of the law itself. So in that sense, uh, the, the, the United Nations will have the possibility of issuing general comments. So general comments is, you know, um, the, 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 the authoritative statements by the United Nations that keeps on um, clarifying the content of the right, especially if the right is one which is dynamic, which does not remain static, and which requires time and again some clarification, then we have the possibility to do that. Third advantage is that under the international human rights law system, uh, human rights law system all countries periodically depending on which convention you're talking about. So it's either every four years or two years, the state has to report on what is being done. So in that sense, if we manage to enforce the human right to environment, then it means that each and every state would be party to this potential convention, to this future convention, then they will be under the legal obligation to report in terms of what is being done when it comes to the protection of the environment um, in that sense. So like this, we do have a um, considerable advantage of if we successfully link the environment and its protection with human rights. If we successfully interpret the, the, the environment as a human right, and if we successfully, uh, of course, first from an academic level through research, but then we will need, for instance, the help of, of, of politician of the state so that we can have um, a formal international recognition of the human rights to environments, right? Because then all of the uh, important components of the human rights system internationally would apply to the human right to environment. And this will, of course, advance the cause of protection of human rights. Uh, as a conclusion, I'll, I'll, I'll um, simply say that, um, you know, none of this system will work without the support of each other. So by no means, we're trying to say that the solution will come from developing uh, a human rights to environment. On the contrary, we are simply saying that the human rights to environment can be uh, a support system to the already existing uh, international environmental law regime. So if we put those two together, and we successfully marry them, then um, you know more progress, especially in terms of state duties, uh, will be will be possible. So um, in in the paper that we we, we are developing, of course, uh, we go into more details in terms of how existing architecture on international human rights can be helpful. But uh, since uh, I have 12 minutes, which I think has already elapsed uh, anyway, um, these were perhaps the three main points uh, that I was wishing to develop. Um, thank you. And of course, if there are questions and discussion, maybe we can take, up, uh, take them up later. Many thanks for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. And also, I think it was uh, very nice to have it after Angelica's presentation because it's somehow connected. So thank you so much. I'm sure there will be some questions for you once we finish with the presentation. So many thanks for your presentation and congratulations for that. Thank you. So our second speaker is uh, Maria Liliana Avalos Rodriguez and Michael McCall. They are from Centro de Investigaciones en Geografía Ambiental. And um, we are very happy because they were in Tarragona some years ago. And it's very nice to share this space also, this virtual space now 
in, in the Tarragona International Environmental Law Colloquium. So the title of the presentation is uh, The Role of Forestry Law and pol Policy in Promoting Actions to Motivate the Reduction of Forest Degradation in Western Mexico. So Liliana, the floor is yours. Dos, 12 minutitos, please. And thank you so much for joining us this evening, this morning for you. Thank you, Beatriz, and hello to all. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this sixth colloquium. I have prepared a video uh, with the audio in English to avoid delays because my English is very, very, very slow. Um, listen. Um, um, can you tell me uh, if you can see the present? Yes, we can see right. perfectly. That's it, Liliana. Okay. All right, thank you. No. The role of law and forestry policy in promoting actions to motivate the reduction of forest degradation in West. Liana, Liana, ¿ya? Eh, eh, ¿Algo ha pasado con el video que se ha parado? Oh my, oh Vemos my. una pantalla como que el video no funciona. No sé si podrías intentar ponerlo de nuevo. Ya, yeah, sí, okay. Liliana? ¿Ya? Sí, sí. Ahora no vemos nada. Oh, ya. Sí, estoy intentando eh, reiniciar el video. El video. Perfecto. Un minuto. In the meanwhile, okay, let's see if it works, but in the meanwhile, um, I think um, maybe you can help us sharing this colloquium through your networks and using the hashtag the 2021 I think it's, it's the one that we are using. And um, as you know, we are sharing the presentations and this colloquium on Facebook. So, um, it will be very nice if you help us with the, the dissemination of this activity. And then um, also there are some tickets left for tomorrow. You can always um, share the link and help us with other people to, to um, connect. Liliana, maybe is it working now? Seve? Sí. All right. The role of law and forestry policy in promoting actions to motivate the reduction of forest degradation in Western Mexico. Forest loss is defined as a combination of deforestation and forest degradation. Forest degradation refers to canopy thinning and carbon loss without a change in land use. However, Forest degradation is expected to grow again. In Latin, in Latin America, the highest percentage of deforestation is estimated to be derived from agricultural, mining, and urbanization activities. However, forest changes due to forest fires, forest production, and migratory agriculture are present. At the 
international level, it is estimated that several countries have passed the tipping stage and are recovering their forests. Mexico is part of the countries that have recovered their forests, even estimated to be in the transition phase to 2020, have recovered 30 to 40 percent of its forest territory. This is because, starting with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, mechanisms have been established for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, conservation and management, sustainable management of these to improve carbon stocks. This is known as network. Through the network mechanism, several countries are sought to increase their efforts to overcome the tipping stage and recover their forests. One of the local responses to ensure forest conservation and achieve the scope of the international network mechanisms through effective policy and legislation. Since 2017, Mexico has a national network strategy, which seeks to reduce emissions from deforestation, degradation, conservation and forest management in order to increase carbon reserves. In addition, Mexico has a broad legal framework since the political constitution of the United Mexican States, as well as six federal laws and two codes of the federal order. Mexico has also had experiences in promoting strategies and actions that promote networks such as early actions carried out in five states, Jalisco, Chiapas, Campeche, Quintana Roo, and Yucatan. These efforts have promoted changes in the vision of forest protection in related communities. One of these changes are the articulation and institutional and political participation of forest communities expressing their interest in participating. The objective of this study was to identify the role of forest law and policy in Mexico based on the actions that have been promoted to reduce forest degradation, mainly in one of the western parts of Mexico that has participated in early actions and where various support has been requested. The different categories of support are based on forest governance, capacity building, technical studies, restoration and reforestation, conservation through the payment of environmental services and environmental compensation. To achieve the objective, an exploratory, descriptive and comparative analysis was carried out with support granted from 2011 to 2020 to Machina, communities and individuals, whether individual and collective belonging to the Intermunicipal Environmental Board for the management of the Lower Aquila River Basin, in the state of Jalisco, made up of 10 municipalities. In addition, a SPOTA analysis was carried out to identify the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of the Mexican forestry legal framework. The main findings of this study are that 61% of the supports have been granted 33% to individuals, whether individual or collective, and only 6% of support has been granted to communities. According to the rules of operation of the programs, there are seven identified categories that grant support. Forest development, technical forest studies, conservation and restoration, forest plantations and production chains, production and productivity, protection of forest and payment for environmental services, as well as payment for environmental water services. Of the support provided to the 104 GMs, it has been identified that 50% are intended for payment for environmental services, 26% for conservation and restoration, 15% to forest development, 5% for forest studies, 3% for forest productivity, and 1% for forest protection. The support provided to the 119 persons is estimated that 48% is intended for conservation and restoration, 43% for payment for environmental services, 8% for forest development, and only 1% for technical forest studies. It has been observed that support for the conservation and reforestation of the forest is most often given to persons, whether physical or collective, and not to agendas as previously thought. Based on the photo analysis, 
Mexico's forestry legislation found some areas of opportunity. There are limitations on the participation of state forestry councils because the 2003 law considered their participation in planning, monitoring, and evaluation of forest policy. Currently, as of the 2018 law, they are only consultative and advisory bodies. Some strengths of Mexican forestry laws that it considers community forest management incorporate some definitions such as actual forest and carrying capacity. In addition, recognizes the legitimate owner suggests the existence of a national forest management system and in 2020 the regulation of this law is published. The main opportunities of Mexican forestry law are that they have duplication of content in the articles of the law. This can be improved through legal reform. In addition, in uniferous forests, preference will be given to the regular forest forestry system and management programs for the use of timber forest resources. Some of the weaknesses of the forestry legal framework is that it limits the participation of state forestry councils, addresses the change of land use in forest areas around cities, does not specify the functions of the national forest management system, automatically authorizes forest use and recognizes the right to hold it peacefully. One of the threats identified is that it does not consider the different classifications of forest land. In addition, it limits the participation of the Ministry of Agriculture in providing incentives to undertake agricultural activities in deforested areas. So, how should environmental law and policies promote and facilitate socio-ecological transformation actions and respond to the current planetary emergency? Possible answers, they suggest. A balance between environmental policy programs and forestry legislation. Because it was noted that there is greater support for the payment of environmental services. In addition, the national network strategy recognizes more social actors that can participate in decision making and a legal framework limits this participation. Network policy in Mexico is progressing, but it is still in the implementation stage and is supported by non-current laws. Finally, Mexico's forestry legal framework has areas of opportunity that need to be addressed to address social participation and forest ownership. Thank you. Um, sorry for incompetence. It's all. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Liliana, for, for your presentation. And also, even if it was a video and it was a little bit uh, difficult to understand it, we are happy and we also want to share that uh, thank you for trying to do your presentation, even if you have some language barriers. So it was fantastic that even if it was a little bit complicated, you keep trying and you finally made it. So thank you for that. Also, I want to remind that the presentation is already in the website. So in case you want to learn a little bit more, you can, of course, ask questions to Liliana later and also check on our website. So thank you very much, Liliana. We will make questions later on. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Liliana. So our next, next uh, presentation, which uh, is also co-authored by uh, Liliana, but also by Juan Jose Alvarado Flores and Jorge Victor Alcaraz Vera. And they are also part of the Centro de Investigaciones en Geografía Ambiental. And the title of their presentation is Environmental Responsibility in Mexico, a view from the degradation of forest. In this case, you can, sorry, you can also find the presentation in, the, in our website. We can maybe share the link here so you can all it. So, uh, Jose Juan, are you there? Hola, buenos días. Buenos días. Permítame, yo estoy este por presentar. Perfecto. Este, 
no sé si ya se esté viendo. Ahora mismo no estamos viendo nada todavía. ¿Utilizarás un PowerPoint? Eh, sí. ¿Le has dado, lo tienes abierto y le has dado a compartir pantalla? Um, es en donde está la camarita, ¿verdad? En donde está la camarita, si sigues un poquito a la, a la derecha, te dice compartir pantalla. Ahí le presionas encima y eliges el PowerPoint que tengas abierto. Okay. A ver. Perfecto. Ahora sí le puedes dar a pantalla completa, ahí justo donde tenías eso. Okay. Perfecto. Ahora lo vemos estupendamente. Solamente a ti no te vemos. No sé si quieras encender tu cámara o dejarla así como quieras. Ah, ok. Sí, este. Lo que pasa es que como luego si enciendo la cámara se puede hacer lento el internet. Ya. Yeah. Entonces, Entonces es puedes una, hacerlo así, no hay problema. Ok, sí, gracias. Eh, Perfecto, gracias. gracias. Bueno, pues yo les voy a presentar el día de hoy lo que es la, eh, en función de pues, la responsabilidad ambiental en México, en función de una vista pues, a través de la degradación de los bosques. Y aquí eh, eh, quiero recalcar que es una, una presentación donde, bueno, se, se quiere incluir, eh, pues más allá también de lo que se hace a partir de eh, lo que es una... Eh, digamos una revisión de la, de, en función de la responsabilidad ambiental pero también en función de lo que se puede hacer este, un poco más allá eh, bueno actualmente se tiene eh, pues anualmente una pérdida de bosque aquí en México de aproximadamente 7 millones de hectáreas y eh, hay algunos problemas importantes eh, en función de la agricultura de la infraestructura de la minería, hay un incremento en, 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 en el aprovechamiento de todas estas actividades y pues eso trae como consecuencia diferentes problemas. Existe la situación de, la, de la, lo que son los gases de efecto invernadero, que muy conocidos por, por todos que ya sabemos que son un problema realmente muy grave y actualmente pues eh, a diferencia de otros países, pues México todavía no hace lo propio comparado con otros, con otros países, ¿no? Que ya han estado en función de poder resolver este problema de los gases de invernadero, de la función agricultural, del aprovechamiento forestal, aprovechamiento minero. Y bueno, en, en México el área total, eh, pues prácticamente en función de los bosques, el 70%, tenemos diferentes... Eh, pues ecosistemas donde tenemos la, la, lo que es la selva, lo que es la zona vegetativa, ¿sí? Y eh, algo aquí importante es que eh, al año, pues, tres, más de 300 mil hectáreas aproximadamente son eh, degradadas. Ya se han hecho algunos, eh, digamos, intentos para poder solucionar esto, pero desgraciadamente, pues, los, los eh, digamos, castigos que se pueden obtener a, a partir de la tala inmoderada o lo que es el prejuicio al medio ambiente, realmente no, no se tienen como tal eh, fuertes todavía, ¿no? Aquí, aquí en, en comparación con, con otros países, por ejemplo, como Alemania, como España, con Canadá. Y entonces, este, Estados Unidos no se tienen esas cuestiones en las ley, leyes federales de responsabilidad ambiental. Y bueno, la responsabilidad ambiental eh, como tal, eh, no está definida en el marco legal mexicano y creo que esta es una de las cuestiones más importantes porque bueno definitivamente si no se tiene un concepto eh, así definido pues no se puede llevar no se puede llevar a cabo un manejo adecuado sobre lo que está permitido o no ¿verdad? y esto bueno viene en función de que en muchos aspectos se tiene pues una ignorancia alta de la, de la ley um, y bueno, eh, en, en función de todo esto, estas características que, que tienen en el medio ambiente que pues van a ocasionar un daño ambiental, que, van a, que va a ser difícil su reparación, que va a ser difícil poder eh, realizar una compensación en función de lo que es la, la, la pérdida forestal, 
esto pues, claramente eh, afecta el medio ambiente mexicano. ¿verdad? Y por lo mismo, pues hay también una situación importante que, bueno, viene como, como consecuencia en función de que hay mucho desperdicio forestal. Y como tal, tampoco hay un control adecuado de, de todo lo que es, bueno, aparentemente desperdicio forestal, que en realidad este, se ha comprobado en muchos países que, bueno, realmente eh, no es un desperdicio, es, un, es, una, es una ganancia de biomasa donde se puede reutilizar para, para fines eh, energéticos, por ejemplo, ¿no? Y de aquí se ha sugerido, por ejemplo, en este caso que la... Eh, actualmente, ¿verdad? Se estima que eh, en México se tienen aproximadamente 278 millones de toneladas de, de residuos sólidos en función de, de, de biomasa. Esto implica una eh, energía potencial que se puede llegar a obtener para esta cantidad de biomasa, pues aproximadamente de 2.980 pentajoules. Eh, esta, es, esta es una cantidad enorme. De, de energía y de esto pues el 58% del potencial de, se hace a partir de, del bosque el 27% de lo que es la, la agricultura y residuos forestales entonces realmente sí se tiene una ganancia de ener energética o se puede tener una ganancia energética bastante alta, ya hay, hay intentos de industrias donde a partir de lo que son eh, reactores de pirólisis, reactores energéticos para, para el aprovechamiento del estadio más allá hay algunos, principalmente en los estados de mayor, de mayor desarrollo industrial, como los son Monterrey, Chihuahua, este, eh, Durango, Querétaro, algo, algunas en la, propiamente en la Ciudad de México. Ya hay algunos eh, intentos, intentos importantes de, para poder resolver esto, pero eh, bueno, eh, finalmente lo que es debido al, al aspecto jurídico, eh, pues todavía se tiene una muy mala regulación. ¿no? Hay que aclarar que también las multas como tal que pueden llegar a tener los propietarios de, de algunos predios y de algunas hectáreas que no son tan poquitas, algunos son hasta de 100, 300 hectáreas que son eh, propiedad de algún, de algún dueño, este, pues realmente no hay, una, no hay una multa fuerte como tal cuando no se tiene el cumplimiento de la ley en general en este aspecto. Eh, aquí, bueno, ¿de dónde provienen estos residuos? Principalmente, pues, de los aserraderos, principalmente, pero también hay otros, hay otras derivaciones de obtención de residuos, por ejemplo, de la poda de, de ciertos, eh, de ciertas especies, por ejemplo, como el aguacate, eh, árboles frutales, ¿verdad? Como lo que son este guayaba, pera, manzana, también. Todos estos este, son residuos forestales, residuos importantes. Y bueno, se estima que aproximadamente 728.846 toneladas por año se generan de biomasa y bueno, tienen un potencial energético de hasta 13.897 terajoules. Es una cantidad también enorme que eh, desde mi punto de vista creo que se está desaprovechando esta situación, ¿no? esta, esta importante cantidad. Y esto también viene dado porque, bueno, el, el reglamento jurídico no establece en realidad una, eh, que cuando se tiene un desperdicio muy alto, pues en realidad, pues se, se, les, se les indique que tienen que hacer esto para un aprovechamiento energético. Y este, no se les indica, solamente es una decisión prácticamente del dueño, de decir, lo voy a utilizar para mi, mi estufa de secado o, o para alimentar una caldera o... O, o simplemente si no me sirve, pues simplemente lo tiro, ¿no? O hago algo, pero la ley no le exige. Eh, como tal, eh, tiene que hacer un proceso de energético, etc. ¿no? Y bueno, eh, las maderas principalmente usadas, bueno, son coníferas y, y latifoliadas, principalmente algunas, algunas coníferas son las que tienen estas, estas mayores eh, potenciales energéticos. Entonces, aquí lo, hay algunos eh, organismos, por ejemplo, los mecanismos de RedMas, que han intentado pues, hacer eh, lo propio para eficien, eficientar el, el impulso energético. Hay, eh, y bueno, 
hasta cierto punto han logrado algunas cuestiones, también no, no solamente en el área forestal y no solamente con el biomasa terrestre, también aquí este, falta, eh, vale, la pena, vale la pena comentar lo del sargazo, por ejemplo, que es una biomasa marina que también se han hecho importantes eh, aportaciones recientes para poder resolver el problema de, de las costas de lo que es el, el, el Caribe mexicano. ¿no? Entonces, eh, es una situación pues, que se quiere implementar. Una de las principales maneras en las que se intenta resolver este problema y que se puede eh, complementar es precisamente que... Eh, por supuesto, la, la, la cuestión jurídica pues, es muy importante. Aquí debe de promover lo que es la compensación, este, inclusive de un buen aprovechamiento. Pero bueno, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se puede hacer más allá? Porque también luego viene el problema de que sí, bueno, ya, ya la ley, el, el aspecto jurídico lo está implementando o lo quiere, lo está diciendo que se tiene que hacer, pero luego la, la gente no sabe cómo. O sea, la gente... Eh, y sobre todo aquí en México hay muchas zonas donde dice, bueno, sí, ya quiero hacer un aprovechamiento de biomasa, pero ahora cómo lo voy a hacer. Y ¿Sí? porque ya la ley me está obligando a hacerlo, entonces ahora cómo lo hago. Bueno, una de las soluciones que se pueden utilizar es lo que es eh, la pirólisis de la biomasa. ¿Y cómo se hace la pirólisis de la biomasa? Pues bueno, es un, es un proceso en lo que es, este, no me voy a meter muy, mucho a, a fondo de esta parte, este, sé que no es parte eh, como tal de, del Congreso, pero bueno, nada más a grandes rasgos, y de hecho esta es la única, eh, la única laminilla que voy a presentar. Este, a grandes rasgos, pues la biomasa puede ser calentada, ¿verdad? pirolizada en ausencia de oxígeno a partir de un gas inerte, eh, utilizando, por ejemplo, nitrógeno, argón, helio, y eh, principalmente el nitrógeno para poder obtener gases de como eh, biocombustibles. Estamos hablando de metano, estamos hablando de etano, de propano, donde se puede obtener carbón este, también como subproducto. Y todo esto se puede obtener a partir de, que, de la modelación para la obtención del llamado triplete cinético. Este triplete cinético pues es, es eh, la obtención de sus características más importantes, como lo que es el, la energía de activación, los órdenes de reacción, los grados Z, lo que es el orden de frecuencia. Y pues aquí se hacen todos, todo un estudio, por ejemplo, en este caso calculamos aquí lo que es el análisis termogravimétrico. Como ven ustedes, hay algunas ecuaciones, ¿no? ecuaciones logarítmicas, ecuaciones diferenciales, que a partir del modelo matemático implementado se puede llegar a escalar a una planta pirolítica de residuos forestales que bien puede aprovecharse para generar carbón, para generar eh, bio, biocombustibles para generar aceite generar, generar también algún tipo de alcohol inclusive y aquí en, en el último este, eh, aquí en esta presento lo que es un, un, un vehículo automotor en función de, de baterías de, de celdas de combustible donde ya se utiliza el hidrógeno este hidrógeno que es uno de los gases principales que se pueden obtener a partir de pirólisis este hidrógeno ya se puede aplicar directamente a una celda de combustible y hacer funcionar el auto. Eh, cuando fuimos a España en 2015, recuerdo con mucho gusto que en, aquel, en aquellos años eh, pude, pudimos ver un, una hidrogenera y este, vimos un, un auto de, de hidrógeno que por ahí ya se están implementando. Supongo que ahorita ya son más comunes. Eh, y bueno, este, este hidrógeno... Eh, Puede ser un hidrógeno también muy limpio porque a partir de la biomasa precisamente se puede obtener de una manera eh, sustentable, ¿verdad? Porque también el hidrógeno es, eh, es bien conocido que se puede obtener a partir de petróleo, como un residuo de petróleo. Pero pues ahí se trata de que ya el petróleo ya no esté involucrado, ¿verdad? Lo, lo menos posible que esté involucrado. Eh, y bueno, este, aquí en este caso, eh, como conclusión, yo voy a comentar que eh, pues hay una, hay una responsabilidad ambiental México realmente muy limitada en el hecho de, 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 de los daños causados a partir del aprovechamiento forestal, a partir del aprovechamiento en función de, de medidas de actividades de agricultura. Eh, el bosque mexicano pues realmente tiene una constante degradación y deforestación. Falta este, pues, sobre todo esta, esta parte de la responsabilidad ambiental 
y bueno, eh, considero que se, se, se tiene un, no hay un balance eh, eh, en función de la cuestión de la eficiencia de los residuos forestales, eh, necesita también haber una importante participación social, de que promueva esa participación y bueno, tener una adecuada eh, en función de la energía, pues también promover una eh, implementación energética eh, hasta cierto punto externa, porque también puede ser que la energía llegue a comunidades alejadas a partir de eh, el aprovechamiento de los residuos forestales y la aplicación de, pues, ¿por qué no pensar de celdas de combustible en este tipo de ambiente? Eh, y bueno, pues por mi parte sería todo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, dear Jose Juan. A very interesting presentation. So um, we move to the next uh, panelist. Uh, we have um, Diogo Andreola Serraglio and uh, Fernanda de Salles Cabedon Capdeville. I'm really happy to welcome you both to, to talk about climate, climate induced uh, migration that you know is uh, one of my favorite topics. So I'm really looking forward to, to listen to your presentation. And um, I just want to say that the title of their presentation is Integrating Climate Induced Mobility in Climate and Migration Policies in Brazil, Challenges and Ways Forward. So thank you very much, Diogo and Fernan Fernanda, for being part of the TIEC family and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Beatriz. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Great. Uh... We, Fernanda and I, uh, we are very pleased uh, with the opportunity to attend the colloquium. Uh, Fernanda apologizes uh, for not being here uh, today. She had a few problems, uh, unexpected situations back in Brazil, so she's not able to join us, unfortunately, but here I am. I'm going to try to do my best. Uh, And I also apologize for having like my, my webcam seems a little bit dark. We were also just like our colleague in the UK having an amazing day, like 30 degrees here in Italy and all of a sudden it got cloudy and I got here in the dark. Uh, Fernando and I, we are both members of the South American Network for Environmental Migrations. Uh, the title of our presentation is, uh, as Beatrice mentioned, Integrating Climate-Induced uh, Mobility uh, in Climate and Migration Policies in Brazil, Challenges and, and Way Forward. Uh, and when we saw the call uh, for the, the colloquium, we thought uh, that uh, the topic would be quite interesting because, of course, Uh, when we are talking about environmental law, we are always uh, trying to uh, have uh, somehow or to some extent transformative responses. Uh, and we thought that it was going, uh, it, it would be a nice opportunity to show uh, the reality of uh, the, the legal reality of human mobility in the context of climate change in Brazil to show that at the moment, instead of having transformative responses, That's what we all expect. We are facing scenarios that somehow are hampering solutions uh, to this so-called planetary emergency or uh, polycrisis where we see political, social, climate, environmental, and more recently, uh, sanitary uh, challenges. So we would, we would like to show how um, we have seen setbacks when it comes to human mobility or climate-induced uh, mobility in Brazil. Uh, with no further observations, I, I just bring here the outline of my presentation. So I briefly talk uh, about the linkages between climate change and human mobility in Brazil. Then uh, to better understand uh, the situation at the national level, we raised a few recommendations from the international agenda. Uh, on the topic, we see how the topic has been included in national climate and migration policy and legal frameworks. And then um, in the end, uh, we interpret uh, these recent climate and migration policy setbacks in the country. Um, so we're starting with the linkages between climate change and human mobility in Brazil. Uh, we do know that uh, South America 
has uh, often suffered from the impacts of El Nino. It's a, a huge region and we have distinct realities. Uh, so when we are talking specifically according, uh, um, specifically about Brazil and how climate change has impacted the, the national territory, we have some uh, estimates from the Brazilian panel of climate change. And it is estimated that in the next for decades, uh, the rise on the temperature will range between one and five degrees Celsius. And as a result, we are gonna, we see a reduction uh, in precipitation patterns uh, in the North where the Amazon is, as well as in the Northeastern uh, region or parts of Brazil. Uh, and in turn, we see more extreme weather events uh, in the Southern areas. Uh, so, for instance, the northeast of Brazil is becoming an arid area, which is leading to food insecurity, for instance. Uh, we started to see uh, tropical cyclones uh, in the south of the country, uh, which is not normal. Um, we also see uh, prolonged uh, droughts uh, in the north, in the Amazon region, affecting communities um, um, indigenous and other traditional communities along the Amazon uh, River. And all of these situations are leading to uh, human mobility or displacement of people because of environmental or climatic impacts. Uh, and to show uh, how this has uh, affected uh, the population in Brazil, uh, we also brought some existing data on the topic. So, uh, according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, the IDMC, between 2008 and 2019, uh, 11 million uh, people were displaced in the whole South America uh, because of droughts, flooding, and also tropical uh, cyclones or storms. Uh, in this context, Brazil accounted for 15% of all uh, displacements associated with disaster. That means around 2 million people, uh, or an average of 180,000 people per year. Uh, only last year, in 2020, uh, more than 350,000 people were internally displaced due to disaster in Brazil. Um, and just to highlight that we, we have uh, internal displacement in Brazil, but we also have cross-border movements, right? Uh, so, for instance, uh, in 2010, in the aftermath of the uh, earthquake that is struck uh, AT, we had people coming to Brazil. Um, IDMC collects data related to disaster. We have to acknowledge, for instance, the role of gradual or slow onset processes in the decision to move. Uh, and in this regard, the Brazilian Integrated Disaster Information System reported uh, in 2019, more than uh, 3,900 um, climatological events in the country. And 60% uh, of all these events, they were associated with droughts. I'm sorry that all the, the information in this slide is in Portuguese. Um, I'm trying to translate it a little bit. So that means that in Brazil, like almost 50% of, effect, of the affected population um, or the, the population that needed to uh, move uh, relates to slow onset processes. Uh, so this is the reality of uh, climate induced migration in, in the country. Um, this slide uh, brings a few recommendations from the international agenda on the topic. And we do know that we, we have distinct layers of governance that have been dealing with the topic in, in the last years. Uh, and here we brought um, the recommendations or the, um, the strategies and guidelines, so one from two of them. The first one is the UNFCCC and the second one is the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Uh, so when we are talking about the UNF, UNFCCC, mentions to the topic were, uh, the topic was first acknowledged in this agenda uh, in 2010 during COP16, then again in COP18, and finally during the Paris uh, uh, Agreement in 2000, uh, 2015. Um, 
The Paris Agreement established or recommended, uh, requested the, the development of a task force on displacement uh, to be developed uh, by the Executive Committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism on uh, Loss and Damage. And they were tasked uh, to build recommendations to prevent and reduce human mobility in the context of climate change. These recommendations were presented in 2018 um, during the COP24. Uh, and even though there's an increasing acknowledgement of the topic in climate uh, policies uh, at the national levels, they recommend uh, the adoption of a specific legislation, the integration of the topic in national adaptation plans and DCs to enhance data quality and availability and so on. Um, for its turn, uh, the GCM, the Global Compact, um, that's a process that is started in 2016 with the New York Declaration on Migration. Uh, and the, the whole process uh, lasts uh, for two years. So uh, the, the final draft of the document was approved uh, also by the end uh, of 2018. And, there may, and the document, the final draft, uh, bring many, uh, brings many recommendations related to uh, environmental factors as driver, drivers for migration, such as objective two, five, uh, and, and 23. It's basically the same uh, in terms of content, uh, the same that is recommended by the, the task force on displacement, which means that both documents are uh, complement each other. Um, so this uh, said, uh, now I would like to bring this reality to Brazil and to show uh, to what extent Brazil, uh, Brazil has aligned or integrated these international uh, recommendations when it comes to uh, climate-induced mobility. So we're starting with uh, the climate agenda uh, or the climate policy and legal framework in Brazil. Uh, we analyzed the national policy on climate change that was established in 2009, and that is the uh, framework for mitigation and adaptation at the national level. So this policy is composed by several uh, action plans. They are uh, mostly aimed at reducing uh, greenhouse gases emissions. So it's a policy that hardly addresses adap the adaptation component. And as a result, uh, we don't see mentions or references or effective actions to deal with human mobility in the context of climate change. Uh, before the new ad administration, we had a few debates uh, related to revisions and to include uh, adaptation aspects uh, in this policy and of course to include migration. Uh, but uh, ever since 2019, uh, we don't have any, any further developments in this regard. Uh, we also analyzed uh, the national communications. Brazil presented three NCs or national communications to the UNFCCC, the first one in 2004, 2010, and 16. Uh, and the very first one from 2004, they do acknowledge or recognize uh, human mobility as a social consequence of desertification processes. And they also mention uh, communities that to some extent are threatened uh, by sea level rise. The second national communication reiterates uh, or repeats this information. And the third one from 2016 uh, highlights the impacts of disasters um, and its uh, linkages with economic losses and damages. And it also uh, bring as an example of a displacement caused by climate change, um, floodings and uh, heavy rains uh, in a state called Santa Catarina in 2008 uh, that affected more than 1.5 million people. Um, from this number, I think that approximately 70,000 people were uh, compelled or were displaced uh, by all this uh, situation of, uh, of floodings that lasted over like 40 days or so. Uh, what is important here in this uh, national communication is that it provided the entry point for discussions on the topic in the National Adaptation Plan. 
that was published in 2016. So this document mentions uh, the relationship uh, or the linkages between extreme weather events and human displacement. They bring the definition for, from the IOM, from the International Organization for Migration, and the definition of environmental migrants. So there's a recognition. Uh, they, the document uh, emphasizes uh, that the, the national government um, supports the idea of migration as an adaptation strategy, but there are no effective uh, actions to tackle or handle with uh, climate-induced mobility. Uh, um, which, which lead us to the conclusion that uh, our the, the climate, climate agenda at the national level make generic, general or generic references to the topic without it specific provisions. On the other hand, uh, when we are analyzing uh, the national migration policy and legal framework, uh, we do know that uh, in 1907, Brazil established the Brazilian Refugee Statute, which means that Brazil ratified uh, the 1951 Convention on Refugee, its 1967 protocol. It also endorsed uh, the 1984 Cartagena Declaration, uh, which brings or brought an extended definition of refugee, including massive violation of human rights. Uh, this definition was partially incorporated uh, in this legislation uh, from 1907, uh, but um, the national authorities or uh, the, the national government tends not uh, to associate uh, massive violation of human rights with uh, environmental issues, only political circumstances. And, and this was quite clear um, this positioning was uh, quite evident in the aftermath of the earthquake that is struck uh, 80 in 2010. Uh, at the occasion, not a single ATN uh, was admitted as a refugee between 2010 and 2015, meaning that uh, the legal framework uh, was not an option to deal with human mobility in the context of climate change. Um, on the other hand, uh, the national government provided a discretionary response through the normative resolution 97 of 2012, through uh, providing humanitarian visas, um, or providing, excuse me, uh, visas for humanitarian reasons. Uh, this was an ad hoc uh, mechanism that benefited at least 100,000 ATNs as for 2018. Uh, and what is important to highlight here is that uh, these uh, visas for humanitarian reasons, they were, uh, uh, the topic was regulated in the 2017 uh, migration or national migration law. So uh, this new legislation allows the granting of temporary uh, visas or humanitarian visas in the context of environmental hazards. Uh, so now we are talking about um, uh, something legally binding and not something that depends on the discretion of national authorities. Uh, this law at, back in 2017, 2018, uh, made Brazil like a, a reference in offering uh, legal pathways uh, to environmental migrants. However, uh, the law has not yet taken effect. And we have many issues that are still pending regulations, such as the definition of environmental disasters, such as the criteria of admission and stay. Um, and this policy was enacted before the, the approval of the Global Compact, which means that it, ideally it could be already revised or updated. So uh, we even though we don't have a concrete uh, or effective actions uh, at place to deal with environmental migration, we can see some progress or recognition uh, to the topic. But uh, we see that ever since, uh, since 2019 with the new administration, uh, things somehow are, are on hold uh, and we don't have like further development. So, um, Bolsonaro administration has uh, dismantled many of the country's uh, policies going against 
uh, the role that Brazil always played at the international level, the Ministry of Environment. I I'm sorry if I'm exceeding the time. I, I need just one more minute. Uh, so for instance, uh, the Ministry of Environment uh, its structure has been reduced. Uh, the Secretariat of Climate Change and Forest were uh, eliminated and they were responsible for the implementation of climate strategies. The budget of the Ministry of Environment was reduced by 90%. Uh, we have important um, uh, leaders uh, now that are climate deniers negotiating uh, in climate nego negotiation. Uh, we had the end of the Amazon phone fund, which was responsible for more than a hundred uh, projects at the national level. And the picture has not been different when it comes to the migration uh, sphere. Uh, one of the, the first acts uh, from the new administration was the withdrawal from the GCM. And now, uh, of course, the, the, the migration law has not yet taken uh, effect. And we do have a draft bill that tries to uh, prevent it from uh, being applied at the national level uh, under the, uh, the argument that uh, it would threaten national sovereignty. Uh, so just as a conclusion, uh, we do have uh, mentions, they are still generic. Um, and the thing is uh, maybe right-wing populist attitudes and behaviors are at the moment threatening further developments on the topic at the national level. So uh, these are sad times, I would say, because we could have, uh, as the, 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 the title of the colloquium suggests, like transformative responses, but that's not what we see, uh, unfortunately, at the Brazil. Um, we are like living moments where we are scared uh, with never ending setbacks. So uh, that's it from my side. Uh, we do thank you for uh, your attention. I'm sorry, Beatrice, for exceeding the time. Uh, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Diego. It was a very interesting presentation. You know that um, I love this topic and it was just fantastic to see uh, you explaining the developments in, in Brazil. And I think it's uh, also very interesting to see that the um, environmental or climate migration, it's uh, one of the main challenges of the decades ahead. So I think it was necessary that we discuss this topic on the colloquium. And uh, also it's interesting to see that many countries are starting to, to, to develop this little progress, but at the end, what is really being done. So thank you so, so much for your presentation. So, now, please, all the panelists, could you please turn your cameras on? Because we will have a uh, time for questions and answers. For all the attendees, the audience, please ask your questions on the chat or raise your hand and we will let you make them. Okay, I see that Deo is having some questions. We also have one in the questions and answers. But uh, please, I encourage you to share your questions, your doubts so about these uh, fantastic presentations that we have had in this first panel of the DX. So um, while we're waiting, maybe we can start with uh, Clara's question. Clara is one of the organizers of the TX, so we are really happy that she has this very interesting question for you, Angelica. And uh, she's asking, she's saying that um, Thank you very much, Angelica, for your revealing and vindicating speech. And she's asking, during your presentation, this question came to her mind. Should international environmental law limit technoscience or could it prevent environmental damage to some extent? Should technoscience be completely ruled out of the stake of the production reproduction balance? I can see that she has been thinking a lot about this question. And she will be very happy if you, Angelica, can answer back. Thank you so much for, for the question, Clara. Actually, I'm happy that um, you allowed me a few minutes to think about it. Uh, it's a, it's a, an interesting and very important question. So I made a few notes in here. Um, two, two things. The starting point uh, is to think international law critically. So a number of people have uh, discussed this, like Anthony Engi, Walter Minolo, on the colonial origins, origins of international law. 
I can put um, the, the, there are links. Uh, I think the first paper is called Francisco de Vitoria and the Colonial Regions of International Law. This is Anthony Engi and Walter Minolo on the making and closing of Eurocentric international law, uh, the opening of a multipolar world order. But the, the thing is that the international law is created as a mechanism to protect colonial businesses. So it has a structurally a contractual legal nature. So that Hobbesian thing, this, uh, this trap that we, we were forced into and there is no outside. Um, and perhaps uh, colonial intentions of control and scrutiny of markets and businesses um, they are kind of working in the same, in a similar manner, uh, maintaining this ideology, this, this, um, the tentacles uh, of of this structure that we cannot see uh, a way outside of. Uh, so, how how do they do? They make the home state law enforceable in the colony. And that hasn't changed in capitalism, actually. Since the very beginning of capitalism, we are working in this um, mechanism. We, we started in the uh, first phase of capitalism, industrial capitalism, and now the financial capitalism. And that's what we're dealing with. We're here in the internet. Uh, but who owns the internet? So, uh, and at what cost? Environmental cost. And I'm not saying carbon footprint. So uh, this, this is internationally regulated. Who regulates Zoom? Um, and this is the kind of technology that we should be looking at. But just to, to finish this point, um, I'm not saying that one shall not resort to international law mechanisms and remedies. What I'm saying is that um, it cannot be perceived as the lifeline to address uh, the complete lack of liability of businesses and the impossibility of get held, holding them liable. It's a corporate veil because um, uh, how can you regulate tech companies? This is the cutting edge research, but the most important conversation takes place locally, I think. It's also necessary to have a coalition at international level. The question is whether international law legal commitments could address local needs and at what cost. There is a political cost for this to take place as well. Who is going to enact this kind of law and gaining what in exchange? We have the, the, the name we shall never say uh, as the president of my country and he's selling it cheap. Fascists, Bertolt Brecht has a, has a sentence that the fascists are always there waiting for the liberals to take uh, their, their lead. So I think that's, that's the challenge at the moment. Um, most importantly, would uh, such local communities have the power to lead the guidelines for research and development or, or for being active in the activity of defining what kind of technologies we're aiming for or in need? Or are we there sitting waiting for some Tesla cars because it was a good deal in the procurement that the state was negotiating? We cannot negotiate vaccines in Brazil. Imagine of a green technology for, you know, it's, it's uh, it's there is a political element and this is more important than ever and the second point as I haven't made the, the thousand points already uh, the second point I would like to make is the about this techno utopia mastery of nature that is much more about increasing production uh, uh, instead of aiming for balance uh, of course new technologies are welcome, we shall never deny cutting edge science, but we must look at it historically, uh, uh, critically, of course. Above all, I think uh, we should always ask, who is benefiting from, from this? Um, does this actually change something or is this green money? Um, electric cars are excellent ideas, but they're also um, ways to prevent us, they are silencing weapons ways to prevent us from discussing the urgent needs of less cars in the planet. It's not that I'm against solar panels, but we need to discuss the amount of energy. Hydroelectrics in Amazonia are for the aluminum industry. 
we, what else do we need uh, to understand, to realize that we should stop, uh, we should go backwards, we should uh, aim for the growth or to revert the pace of this uh, I, I, I always get um, passionate about things. You should see my students. <laughs> well, I think I answered the question. It was like took me 10, 10 minutes to, to say, sorry. Uh, if you allow me, <laughs> I, I can you, and two hours. <laughs> I can understand that. And um, Clara is saying that, uh, thank you so much. And she was nodding all the time. So I think uh, she agrees a lot with you and your perspective. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. So... Another one of our co-organizers, Deo, he's also having some questions and I think he wants to make them with his microphone and camera on. Uh -huh. But in the meanwhile, I just wanted to say that the last week I was in another conference and we had um, some attendees from Brazil and there was a lady from Movimiento Atingidos por Parragens. I don't know if my pronunciation is uh, good. And she was saying exactly that. She was asking, she was from the Amazonian region and she was saying what uh, you just said. She was saying that uh, who, what, who is going to use this energy for, that uh, they were totally affected and they were not getting the, the positive outcomes of, of that. It was a very revealing perspective. So thank they you get so much. All for the downsides That's it. and they don't get any upside. It's, it's like a... And we are all okay with that. And this is not, not that we are yeah. um, um, ignoring this, but we should be out there, you know, breaking, exploding cars because this is out of control. Totally. I don't know. There is something wrong with us, maybe. <laughs> so thank you, Angelica and Deo. Thank you so much for asking questions. So please. Thank you, Bea. And congratulations on moderating this fantastic panel. <laughs> Um, my first question is directed to Dr. Angelica Freitas, and I have a second question for Professor Rupanant. And my first question, well, first of all, thank you, Angelica, for the great presentation. My question is, how do we successfully recover indigenous cosmovisions or even indigenous legal practices that were forcibly removed during colonization, especially those uh, regarding the protection of nature without them being co-opted or rationalized, or as you said, uh, without attributing meaning through a modern colonial epistemological lens. This is to say, how do we avoid those ancestral knowledges becoming objects of study and research of white academia? And then I make my second question for Professor Rupanand in the same line as my last question. How do you assess the risks regarding the use of the human rights narrative? For example, when granting legal personality to nature, how do we avoid the concept of nature being captured by the legal institutions of coloniality? Uh, thank you both so much for your stimulation, stimulating speeches. And I, I think this, is, this has been uh, an extremely stimulating panel and thank you uh, everyone on the organizing committee as well. Thank you, Deo. So, Angelica, maybe you can answer to his first question. Deo, I'll try to be uh, brief. Thank you so much for, for this question. This is actually the question. This is how, uh, this, this is the, 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 the nevralgic, the central point. Um, we had experiences in Ecuador. I, I, I don't know if you're, any of you are aware of. Uh, Ecuador during the early 2000s, Rafael Correa, uh, who is a progressive guy, um, uh, there is no exit in coloniality, is there? Um, and and uh, Correa um, spoke with the People's Alliance and a lot of people uh, by to, to bring the Sumac Kausai, the Buen Bibir, from the indigenous communities into the constitution. And they did it. And then, and then it was addressed, a silencing weapon, the Lernian Hydra. If you cut just one head, 
all the three will grow. So you cannot address this simply as a political issue, as a legal issue, as addressing this in the constitution. And of course, you cannot negotiate with God and the devil at the same time. Uh, and this demands uh, political bravery because in the epoch of imperialism, it's very difficult to, to get a government facing this kind of powers. So we see that in Peru, they had the left elected this weekend and it is already collapsing. So we had the experience all... Uh, throughout Latin America, Mexico has um, a liberal, leftish uh, connotation, but the struggle, to, when it pierces institutionality, it must have decision-making power. And in the legal system, that's why I said that reforming this system is so complex, uh, and I don't believe it, because when you propose a reform in this system to add, for example, numbers, they are discussing decolonizing the university, inclusion and diversity. So let's have two of them, two of them, and we have the quotas. So you speak for the entire African continent, you speak for, uh, and, and then issues are addressed and and of course this is not the way it should be so i'll sound very uh techy in saying that we should join the struggle there is no outside uh popular movements you join uh from um away from home as i am uh i try to join international networks and in this sense i get aware of what's uh i become aware of what's going on and um, um in this sense we can exercise some pressure in 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 government but without uh, actually facing the structure of capital, racism, and, and patriarchy, uh, we will not address... Angela Davis, just to finish, Angela Davis says that if you analyze these in instances separately, they work in favor of the structures of power. So every time we try to come with some... That's why it's much heavier, much uh, more difficult, uh, because it, it takes a village. Thank you so much. Ropa Nand, there was a question for you too. Maybe you can... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, dear, thank you very much for this very interesting question. Um, of course, uh, my area of expertise is, is not necessarily uh, colonization and, and, and related literature to it, uh, but then still I'll try to answer it from mostly a human rights perspective. So uh, <clears throat> I think the difference that we have to make is uh, between what, uh, uh, for, inst for instance, Dio understood in terms of uh, the legal personification of nature, which is uh, what I said was done in a lot of Latin American countries, through their constitution and from what we are trying to do here in terms of uh, uh, some African scholars. So what we're trying to do is exactly not to get into that discourse of personification of the nature that is giving a legal personality to the environment because uh, when we have looked at literature on that side, we have seen how, uh, you know, the uh, to colonially deconstruct this particular uh, phenomena can be quite uh, uh, difficult, especially when it comes to its acceptance uh, at the global level. Um, so this is why rather than going into that direction, it was more about um, this idea, which uh, for some decades has already been discussed, is already in literature, uh, which is whether or not we as human beings, we do have a right to environment. So whether this idea can be formalized, whether this idea can be given legal recognition, just like, as I said, the right to life, the right to protection against torture, the right to housing, to, to food, etc., etc., has been uh, given a legal meaning. So. Our discourse is more, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, right, we've all accepted that we have human rights and the UN as the global system has indicated that uh, immense importance is being given to this, uh, this particular field. So then we thought of, uh, you know, taking the human right to environment uh, and giving it legal and formal recognition so that, uh, you know, we can exactly get that vertical relationship of, on the one hand, right holders, 
and on the other hand, duty bearers in the sense that, you know, it, it does not even become a discussion as to whether uh, the environment is a legal person in itself. And if that is the case, then, uh, you know, uh, to what extent it, it should be protected. In, in fact, it's the contrary in the sense that we are human beings. So just like life is important to it, then by extension, the environment is important to us. Because if we live in an environment which is not being protected, which is being constantly violated and, and, and which is posing a, a health hazard to ourselves, then automatically the right to life would be violated. So if we recognize the environment as a human right, then automatically we, we, we can, we can um, derive the benefits of uh, uh, protections that normally the state is supposed to give. But then, of course, having said that, it, it, of course, I mean, so many states have recognized and asked uh, our state parties to a lot of treaties and convention on human rights, but but we, we do see violations on a daily basis, which, which means that this is not necessarily a perfect system, but then, you know, it is one that, as I said, could at least be, uh, could at least act as a support to, the already existing international uh, environmental law regime. So um, do you, maybe I express myself uh, in a difficult way when I was doing the main presentation, but then, you know, the, the whole idea was not necessarily to give legal personality to nature. As I said, this has already been done, but I was, was you know, somewhat different in terms of to give, uh, you know, more recognition to the uh, human rights to environments, because this could be a way to, better protect the environment. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that's such an interesting proposal and thank you. It's now much more clear for me and thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. I think uh, this is also very related to um, one presentation that we will have on panel three on the um, human rights to the environment and ecocentric proposal. So in case you are interested, I welcome you to, to be part of this third session of the TA. We have two questions left and maybe other come are, others are, are coming. So, um, but the, we are already over the time. So I could please kindly ask you to answer it with a short uh, reply, please. So um, Angelica, this is a question from Lorena. She's also one of the organizers of the TA. Thank you, Lorena, for your question. And she's saying, thank you for your excellent presentation. And she's asking, how far do we need to go to deconstruct and reconstruct our social and legal systems to address the planetary emergency? I mean, is there a chance, chance sorry, to effect systemic reforms within the nation state? If so, in your opinion, how? I think this is, you will not be able to answer in two minutes to this question, but... We will oh, be we'll happy do my you best. Can do that. So objective answers are thank you so much, Lorena. Um, how far back do we need to go to deconstruct? Let's see, Mesopotamia. Um, no, <laughs> five thousand years, eight thousand years. No, just kidding. Um, I think it's not about going back. I think it's about learning and looking forward. Um, that would be my point. Uh, the thing is, um, it's it's about the the recovery that we have to make, like the the um, um, the awareness that we have to bring to the institutions is that we are standing on the shoulders of of giants. That and this is an ancestry. And of course, I'm not throwing away the baby with the bathwater. I'm not saying I'm not reading Marx. P perhaps Foucault, I'm not reading, but Marx, I, I'm still reading. So um, th th there is a, a, a middle term when we we say reform. When I say that I don't believe in a reform of this uh, legal system, it is because it has a contractual nature. And I think as long as we are dealing with the state and our dynamics of uh, laws, um, we are uh, working in, in a democracy which is actually a dictatorship of capital. So in this sense, uh, I don't believe in a reform, but I do believe that um, local politics 
uh, transforms um, realities uh, as we get more aware of the kind of uh, people that we have to vote for. So I go back to the uh, political element because it is inseparable. But thank you for your question. <laughs> thank you, Angelica, and thank you for keep to assure the answer that was a challenge. So we have a question for Diogo. This comes from Daniele and uh, she's, she will be doing her presentation on this uh, colloquium also on the panel three. So I think it will be also interesting to see what the, she will explain on her, her panel. And Diogo, she's asking to you, can you see a way to halt Brazil's setback in environmental migration? Would climate litigation and popular participation be an efficient way to do so? Do you see other alternatives? Uh, thank you so much for your uh, question, Daniela. Uh, and to be honest, uh, as a, a researcher on the on the topic on, on climate induced mobility, it is re really sad to see how the topic has been left uh, aside uh, in Brazil. Even though, even more because uh, Brazil was taken ex uh, as an example with the, um, the good practice on uh, visas on humanitarian reasons. Uh, even though afterwards we saw that it was a, a, a palliative measure, it was like a temporary response, uh, and the country had no structure uh, to absorb or receive all those migrants. Um, uh, when it comes regarding our uh, uh, current situation, uh, of course, uh, the role of civil society in keeping or addressing this related to the topic is very important. Uh, and very recently, maybe two or three weeks ago, I attended um, an online meeting uh, with uh, mayors like from a few municipalities uh, in Brazil. Uh, they are updating their uh, organic uh, laws or the, the city law. I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, so of course, there are like developments, uh, civil society is there, like claiming or trying to raise uh, concerns about the topic. Uh, and we also see uh, potential, potential uh, related uh, to climate litigation. We don't have any case of climate litigation that is specifically addresses human mobility in Brazil, but uh, very recently we have uh, a litigation, a climate litigation case related to uh, the new NDC, the new national determined contribution in Brazil, uh, under the argument that uh, the document lacked uh, ambitious uh, mitigation targets. So um, yes, uh, these are the two uh, possibilities uh, at the moment, uh, but there's hope and I'm pretty sure that better days are coming when it comes uh, to effective solutions and actions to tackle the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Diogo. I don't know if there are more questions, maybe. Please, the attendees, this is the moment. If there are no more questions, I think uh, we can finish this first panel this first session of the colloquium once again thank you so much all of you all the panelists that was fantastic angelica it was lovely to hear your your presentation and your motivation and um, also the attendees it was uh, very nice to have you all the organizers thank you so much for your questions for your support also the technical support that we don't see but it's be behind the scenes it was a uh, fantastic so Thank you all and please join us for the seminar tomorrow and also the next day we will be sharing very interesting presentations too and you are all more than welcome. So thank you and see you tomorrow at four again in the room, that, the link that you will receive. And then um, for the panelists, please could you all turn on your cameras because the technical support is asking if we can have a picture all, all together. <laughs> so that would be lovely, maybe, uh, oh, we are missing Ropahal. He's not here anymore. No. So I think we can, uh, Juan Jose, Jose Juan, sorry. Uh, could you turn on your camera maybe? 
we can take the four of us <laughs> the picture <laughs> that would be perfect <laughs> so laura please can you tell me when we are done <laughs> it's okay it's no thank problem. you laura <laughs> <laughs> bye thank you so have a thank nice you. evening everybody Thank See you, you thanks tomorrow. Everyone. Well done for setting up this today. It was amazing, the panel, very interesting. And I'm very proud to, to be part of the TIEC family now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angelica. Same from my side. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye, Diogo. Take care. It was nice seeing you. <laughs> Same. Bye. Ciao. Well done, girls. Yes. So um, uh, we stop um, streaming. Uh, stop recording, I think. And.